If you have an interest in horses and love learning more about horses, the horse industry, teaching, or even managing your own horse business, then you're in the right place. We would love you to join us on our mission, which is to improve the lives of horses around the world through the education of riders, handlers, and trainers. So get comfortable, listen in, and enjoy. This is another of our popular Listener's Choice interviews, which we're playing over the weekend. We've chosen the most popular interviews for you to select the Listener's Choice winner. If you're not sure how the Listener's Choice competition works, have a look at horsechats.com slash choice for the rules and the leaderboard. Today's guest is Peter Shaw. Peter's a dressage specialist coach, educator, trainer, coach educator. He's also an A-level dressage judge and judge educator, and he's an FEI three, four-star judge. How are you today, Peter? I'm not bad. How are you? Great, Peter. Good to hear from you. Peter, can we start off with an inspirational quote that you'd like to tell us about? I guess because my background's been in education, I have a few inspirational quotes. I used to put something on our newsletters all the time just to try and get people to think. Mm -hmm. And there's one that I heard again the other day. I think it came from Henry Ford, but for me it came from Robin Smith, a Grand Prix writer that I've been teaching, but she told me this years ago. And it was, if you think you can or you think you can't, you're probably right. And I really like that. And it's just about, and I've, I've actually reinforced that with her sometimes, and, you know, you go through different times in your writing and judges can be a bit mean or whatever and things go wrong and you just have to not do it for the judges. You have to just keep doing it for yourself and standing up and, you know, yeah, I can do this or I can't do this, whatever. Whatever you decide will happen. There are a few others that I really liked, and I used to put this on my newsletter every so often, and one was, if you were given 24 hours to live, who would you ring and what would you say and why are you waiting? Mm. I really liked that one Mm. because, um, Mm. you know, you never know. You know, I, I go out of my way in everything I do, people think it's a bit odd and I don't want anything when I say it, but I'll often go up to people and just say something good. If I think it, I'll tell them it, whether it's about the way the horse went or the way they deal with something or the way they look or whatever. I I like to be encouraging of them because in, in my horse sport and the things I've done, I haven't been encouraged very much. In fact, I've been anything but encouraged in many, many areas. So mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I don't want anyone else to feel like that. I want them to feel supported and keep going, not necessarily just go and do the wrong thing, but, you know, find out what's working and help them to learn that. I actually have a lot of people contact me and I check on them that nobody knows about that just are struggling or having a hard time or don't know what to do or where to go and and I'll just behind the scenes Mm -hmm. be be talking to them. There was a young early years ago, a couple of years back, and he just started replying to some messages on Facebook that I had. He wanted to ride. He he was excited about trying to ride a horse. But he told me that he really was struggling. He wanted to play polo. But he told the horse to turn left. And every time it, he told it to turn left, it turned right. And in his words, he had an intimate moment with the ground. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, I'll tell it to turn right or whichever, you know, the opposite. And he, he turns the other way and he has another intimate moment with the ground. He said, oh, tr- trouble is I'm having a lot of intimate moments with the ground. So one day I said he'd go riding. I gave him all these blow-by-blow, a bit of a long story. I gave him all these blow-by-blow things to do. You know, keep your hand, reins in your left hand, and keep the horse between your legs, stay in the middle and do this, yep, blah, yep. blah, 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 blah. So he wrote it all out. It was, you could tell. He was, oh, I've, I'm excited. <laughs> Got back to me that day after riding. He said, oh, I was like a big girl. I was kissing the horse. I was, Joe and Ernie were the people who helped him. Kissing Joe and Ernie. I was it was so fantastic. I just walked, but I didn't fall off and I got to do it. I went, oh, buddy. <laughs> You're <laughs> oh, doing good. it tomorrow. Yep. He said, yeah, yep. I am. Anyway, I didn't hear from him. Three weeks later, didn't hear from him. Sent him a message. Three weeks later, didn't hear from him. Sent him a message. And I remember where I was. I was coming out of Wooroloo, three-day event in Western Australia, and I got a message from him. It was his mother. Mm. He died four oh, days after no. the ride. Yeah. 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 He'd had leukemia. He didn't ever tell me he had leukemia. Oh, wow. And he just told me about all the, the things he wanted to live for. Mm, mm. And apparently I'm the only person who spoke to him. Nobody else would be bothered to reply, <laughs> which horrified me. Mm. The whole thing made me a bit sad, but I guess 
the, the good thing was that apparently when I spoke to him, he was all enthused and he'd get up and do things. He used to put a red cape on when his family was sad and he'd fly out into the lounge room like Super Jeff and, <laughs> and make them laugh and go back. But talking to his mother after that, she said, I don't know who you are and don't know what you usually do, but don't stop doing it. So I just still make sure that if someone's struggling, they'll hear from me. You know, it's the horse mm. world's a hard place. Mm-hmm. Not everybody fits into it and people think I fit in in a way, but I, I often don't feel like I fit in either. So, you know, I, I encourage us all to just check on somebody, see how they are. Mm-hmm. You never know. I yep. put Are You OK Day up the other day and one of my mates rang me a few minutes later and said he's not OK. And I thought, oh, I'm glad you rang, you know. Yeah. We should be looking after each other more, whether it's in the horse world or just in the world. We need to be caring for each other and understanding each other's differences. And mm-hmm. So look, that was a long answer to that, wasn't it? <laughs> yes, yes. Well, it was good that you gave us an example. And, um, yeah, I think sometimes those those little things that we think are little things almost we can't even remember, but uh, they make a big difference in other people's yeah, lives. They yeah. Yeah, they yeah. Peter, how did you start with horses? What what were your first memories? Well, I have quite a different start. I put this on my website that um, we lived in the city in Hamilton South. My parents aren't horsey. Mm-hmm. My, I'm a twin. I was, there's an older brother, a younger brother, and a twin sister. And most people haven't seen any of them. But uh, it doesn't matter. We all did our own sports and made our own did our own things. And there used to be horses walking past our front gate. This pack of them used to ride bareback around the street. And I said to my parents, I'd like to do that. I don't know why. Don't know why. Mm-hmm. And they put my pocket money up from 20 cents a week to 50 cents a week. And I paid 50 cents a week to go and ride bareback around the street. A year later, I went to Elizabeth Masters and rode in a saddle for a week. Then I practiced bareback as if I was in a saddle for another year <laughs> and went back. And three years later, I was winning at the Australian Championships, beating 90 adults and 16 years old. And all um, sort of happened pretty quick. I started when I was 11, but I don't know why I wanted to do it. I just wanted to do it. Yeah. But, you know, when it's just something you can do, there's there's something about riding horses that was me. Mm. They get me, I get them. When I first started training things and I'd, feel the aid or whatever when it was right I'd know it was right straight away so I don't know I'm lucky I guess gifted or whatever some might say but I just said I had a fair bit of feel for it and I had a fair bit of balance mm-hmm. you know it's young things we'd just stay on and stick there and look pretty good while we do it I probably don't look so good on a horse anymore because there's more of me but you know you had the feel you had the suppleness and you had the get up and go to go and do it Peter, that the, with the city, what was that? What city? Was that Brisbane? Oh, Newcastle. Oh, Newcastle, it no, okay. It was city. It oh, was Newcastle. Okay. We were, we were near the beach and yeah. this was just the uh, people trucked all these horses in. So it was rough, rough mm, and mm, mm. But I kept doing my thing. Okay. And, and you did a lot of visualisation then? Well, I think I'm a visual learner. Yeah. I think because I'm believe it or not, as a school principal, I'm not a very good reader. I struggle. I can read well enough. But it's not my preferred way of learning something. Mm-hmm. I look and I listen and I experiment and I had good teachers. Elizabeth and Elizabeth the Master, Tina Warmelsdorf yep. and Franz Marie were all on the same page. And I would go to them for clinics. I went, was lucky enough to go to France. I remember because I was so stupid. He, he said, and I had this lazy horse and he said, put your chest out. And he kept on going on about putting your chest out. <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, it is. And you need a stint in the army. And I actually said to him, have you ever tried to push a bulldozer uphill? Because that's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> it, was, it was just like they were tough. In You've got to do it the right way. They weren't giving me too hard a time, but it was a difficult horse. But it was the best horse to learn stuff on Mm -hmm. because it allowed you, it it wasn't hot and if you did it the same way all the time, it did it the same way all the time. Mm -hmm. I won so much on, a horse called Mobs Lane, I won so much on him that, you know, people knocked me all the time, they knocked him all the time, but he kept beating them, Mm. eventing, shaking, dressage, mostly dressage, but he was just an, he was a stallion for a while when I had him to start with, but you never know. used to let himself off at, at, um, when dressage 
Raj was at the polo grounds at Richmond. He'd mm-hmm. let himself off the float every afternoon. Because, <laughs> but he wouldn't go and rape and pillage. He'd go and eat grass. Isn't that funny? <laughs> mm-hmm. He wasn't very stallion. <laughs> <laughs> but he was a good horse to learn stuff on. <laughs> stuff that he taught me, mm. I still use today because it was really good grounding for how to ride a horse properly because after about five years of winning everything, he stopped going on the bit. He just refused to go on the bit. And after screaming out several words that had a letter starting with F, (laughs) (laughs) about five years and you still won't go on the bit, I actually had to learn how to become irresistible to my horse. Um, And well, that's how I put it, you know? Yeah. My horse was resisting me. I had to be okay. able to deliver an aid, especially to the bit, that he would not resist, but he would accept and mm-hmm. be relaxed about. So I learned how to feel his mouth in a forward-feeling way. If I couldn't, I waited till I could get it in halt, then I walked. If I've lost it in walk, I'd come back to halt. When I got it again, I'd go into walk, then I'd go into trot. If I lost it in trot, I'd come back. So for two months, I just spent this time doing this, mm. learning how to put my horse back on the bit, how to not be tight, how to be, you know, Tina always said forward feeling hands. Well, how mm. to bride a horse from the back to the front and not pull its head in, mm-hmm. but be round. So mm-hmm. I thought it was pretty easy. I still think it's pretty easy now, but I think it's one of the hardest things to have a contact that isn't pulling, a contact mm-hmm. that's actually generous, that wants to come forward out of your body while you hold them with your body. Yep. So yep. I think it was a good, a great hook. <laughs> <laughs> okay. People hated it. They didn't like me beating them on him, but he did. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Peter, I'm wondering about you juggling your career with horses. I mean, did you then keep riding right through? Did you have a bit of a break? Did you keep? I've had breaks all the time because mm-hmm. I became a teacher and you get moved around. Mm. And I didn't have the money. Mm. Some people thought, I've got a friend who keeps telling me I've got the talent. But I, everything I'd written, every horse I took to competition, dressage competition I won on with pretty good scores. But I couldn't afford to keep them or I'd sell them or something had happened to them. So I just kept going through the levels. But in the background, I was always doing something with horses, teaching people, mm-hmm. whatever, keeping my eye in. So I never, or judging. Yep. I, was, I was all judging. I'd be with another friend of mine. She was Robin Summers, Robin Horsley it is now. She was 15 and I was 17. And we were traveling to Sydney from Newcastle. And that time it was up the Pacific Highway, which took three hours. It's a two-hour mm-hmm. trip now, but it took three hours. And we started the Hunter Valley Dressage Association together because we wanted somewhere to compete. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we'd be doing that and judging and getting judges and organised. We hand-painted all the letters. I used to hand type. <laughs> we wouldn't do it these days because seven-year-olds are much more grown up. <laughs> but I, I put four pages in the typewriter with carbon paper and hand-typed every draw and got the judges and you name it and uh, got the competition running with Robert and a little committee that we had with the first country club to run the state championships out for the metropolitan area. Mm-hmm. We, are, but we just kept doing things that way and being involved in different ways, whether it was – I haven't competed as much as a lot of other people, and I think people judge me on that, you know, look out, because every time I took a horse out, I beat them. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe they should be happy I'm not taking <laughs> that anymore. <laughs> and it's expensive, you know. I'm travelling a lot at the moment. Mm. And, um, I don't have a place of my own to keep a horse, and mm-hmm. it just adds to expense and I think for me, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing well. So if I can't do it properly because of time and money constraints, then I'd rather not be doing it. Yep, yep, okay. Thinking about people who are looking at working with horses, going in the horse industry, you've been pretty consistent with your thirst for knowledge in the industry. You're consistent with what you're doing. You know, you don't have your own horse, but you're teaching. You know, even now you're, yeah, yeah. you're judging, you, you're going out. I mean, yeah. you're travelling all over the world judging. You're, you're doing stuff. So you're consistent yeah, yeah. and, no, persistent maybe. Probably both, you know, uh-huh. probably both because I've been teaching since I was 16. I've been judging since I was 16. Mm. 
I've taught people who have represented the country in eventing, who have been shortlisted for dressage, whose scores have improved 15% and one lesson repeatedly. Not the same person, because if you do that, you'll go over 100% quite rapidly. Yeah. <laughs> but, but different people. So it's just, there's nothing new about training horses. The horses have more athletic ability now. They're different sorts of movers. But there's nothing new about the way biomechanically they do it and the way a rider should sit mm -hmm. and have the action of asking a horse to do something, the aid to get them to do something. And the way that the jigsaw of, I like to call it a jigsaw in a way, you've, the picture goes together from one exercise to another to develop the horse through the training scale. So yeah, it is consistent and I have been not outside the industry. I've been within the industry judging and riding when I do and competing and coaching for 40 plus years and still teaching people who are winning and still teaching people who improve all the time because it's not always the winners. They don't always like to go and compete, but they the people that come to me want their horses to be going better. They're, they're a quite a group of often quite intelligent, quite feeling people and riders. Mm -hmm. Some of them don't like being pushed. Some of them don't like having to change. But those that do, they understand the communication, the, the higher order communication that I'm looking for with a horse and a human. And it's hard because you, you really have to be consistent. But it's very rewarding when you, you can do such little changes and the horse just improves. I taught a girl for the first time the other day. She brought this very nice young, it was a colt until not so long ago, so it's just a three, four-year-old, and she was lunging. And I just made a few suggestions while she was lunging about her body language and not letting the horse make her go faster and take bigger steps and not losing the connection. And as soon as she started to change those few little things, the horse immediately changed with her and it was immediate. Mm -hmm. And she started, you could see she was one of those people that doesn't say a lot. So it was an interesting character to get some feedback from. But she really started to get that these little changes make a big difference to the lack of conflicting age you're giving the horse. I go around pony clubs a bit nowadays and places and teach judges. I've done a few judge education things, like coach education and rider education. Mm -hmm. And I've put together a whole series of, I guess, power, I hate to say PowerPoint because death by PowerPoint <laughs> comes to mind. <laughs> but let's say interactive presentations mm -hmm. where I talk about the way humans learn as opposed to the way horses learn. Mm -hmm. I talk about the way human and horse biomechanics is similar, mm -hmm. and that if you put yourself in the position in a horizontal plane that you just put yourself in in the vertical plane, you'll see what your horse is doing because of where your hips have gone, where your shoulders have gone, where your crookedness is, is you know? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if, you, if you go from that upright position into that horizontal, you know, all fours position, you will look like the horse. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a depth match with how that works. And, and then I, I teach them about the training scales and what we want. But horses really, a lot of people don't even know that it takes two heartbeats for a horse to know that your heart rate's gone up. So mm -hmm. because they're fight or flight animals, they're really attuned to that. How long it takes them to process something when it's gone wrong or whether they're frightened of it. If we try and kick them past it or push them past it all the time, it may not always be the best thing. Sometimes they need to just stand while you pat them mm. and they check it out and they realize that it's okay. Mm. Sometimes you need to move their legs but control where they go. So I guess for a dressage person, there's a fair bit of horsemanship in me and mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not sure where that came from. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. horse... Wait, can you hear anything? No? That's because we're waiting for someone with a good quality horse product to be advertised here. If that's you, then contact us. Horse chats at horsechats.com and we'll send you the details. Thanks. Thinking about training your riders and training them to be better competitors, what type of core skill, for, for someone who's going to listen, who's going to be, uh, to go on and progress and improve, what type of core skills or character traits do they need to have? Well, we're all different characters. Um, I learnt this. <laughs> probably the hard way 
you really just have to keep your head where your body is. You really just have to ride your horse and forget about everything else. You don't want more than you can get at home. You want less than you can get at home. And I think what we used to do, and I'm not sure it even happens as much as it could in, anymore, but we wouldn't take a horse to a competition, say an event, until we'd had a six-week program of legging it up and getting it fitter and, mm. you know, eventing, say, dressage, jumping, cross-country training, getting it fit. Now some people just drag them out of the paddock and take them. I think you need to be at a higher level than you're competing. So sometimes you need to take the horse, keep the horse home. You need to take it out and show it places so it's, it's better when you take it out. But I think sometimes we compete them too much and too often. I think you need to be training them because the horse is going to lose education when you take it out. And if it's at the limit of its education, then you're going to struggle. Mm -hmm. We need to be confident. We need to be calm. We need to understand how the aids work and we need to be secure in that. And if we're only at a certain stage where we haven't perfected it at all, I think you need to focus on one thing that you're going to try and get, whether it be I'm going to try to get better rhythm, I'm going to try and get better straightness, whatever it is. Don't try for everything and be kind to your horse while you're out. Teach it that it's okay. Give it a reassuring pat on the neck, you know. Mm -hmm. Keep it reassured and calm and keep it travelling forward so that it doesn't start worrying when you worry. The more you worry, the more you grab hold of it, the more you let your ego punish it, then it's not going to happen. It's not going to work. You've just got to be calm and keep your head where your body is. Mm -hmm. That's not always easy, but the more you practice it. I remember years ago, they had a Felspar Festival, Sue Steggles, and her family ran a festival at Felspar, mm -hmm. and they had all sorts of different things. They, they had a cross-country and like a combined training event, which even the likes of Vicky Roycroft and people went in and jumped cross-country on and did a dressage test. They had a side saddle dressage test. They had a part of dirt. They had a pre-caprilli. And I was selected to go in this pre-caprilli, and I knew that Arnold Martin, who was president of Eventing in uh, New South Wales at the time, which wasn't called Eventing New South Wales then, I don't think, but he'd selected me to go in this and I knew that I'd only just got in. He thought I had some talent, but I actually was a bit overwhelmed because there were probably 10,000 spectators. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of people there. It was just one of these things that people went to see. So I went out in this pre caprilli and stopped at one of the fences. It was really muddy, stopped at one of the fences and had another fence down in the pre caprilli They weren't high, but it was just a disaster mm. because I didn't think I belonged there. Mm. So the more I, I just went, you know, what are you doing here? You should be here. The worse I got. Mm. I went out the next week in a one-day event at wherever I went. I can't remember where it farms and drink something. And I won the dressage against all these adults. And I remember Heath Ryan said to me, oh, my gosh, you've done a lot of work on this week. I went, no, I just changed my attitude. Mm. And instead of thinking I didn't belong, I think I just thought, just ride your horse. This is cool. It's good enough. Yep. And it does change. Mm. Mm. I know there are long answers that do go on. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's interesting, you know. You, you keep coming back to this whole, you know, the mind power, the attitude. You've come back to that a couple of times. So, you know, I think that's something that the listeners can think about as well. Look, I don't – people might not like hearing this. When I was young, I was 16 and I won the Australian Championships. I beat 90 adults. There was a – it was a heat, a semi-final and a final. I couldn't walk up to the scoreboard at many competitions because of the things that people were saying about myself and my horse. My parents weren't involved in coming with me. They, they were good people, but they weren't horsey. Mm -hmm. So they didn't understand. But I was there pretty much by myself as far as family. And I had a very, what people considered, ordinary horse that I trained, I guess, well and consistently. So, you know, I gave it that aid, it did that. I gave it that aid, it did that all the time, you know, and it was a pleasant picture. Um, people hated that I was beating them. And honestly, they were just horrible. So I learned for myself then that succeeding wasn't working for me, but I didn't stop succeeding. I just hid my success. Mm -hmm. And this is coming back to my teaching days. And I guess why I encourage people, I find the people who might be struggling or I, I don't necessarily find them, I, I notice them mm. and I just support them. You mm -hmm. know, I, I go, 
and I do something behind the scenes to, to prop them up until they feel good and go well because that didn't happen for me. I was given this, you don't belong, you should be here, you know. It didn't matter what I did, it wasn't going to work for me. So I guess that's part of the coming, where I come back to all the time, that, you know, why did I keep going? Mm, Because mm. I really liked my horse. Mm. I was even criticised for smiling while I was riding. It was a nice horse, I was doing well. Mm. As far as communication with him, and I think that's held true for every horse I've ridden, everything I've trained and what I try to get people to do when I'm coaching them and certainly judging them is, is harmony is a really important thing. That The horse understands what you're asking it, that you ask it nicely. Mm-hmm. Of course, if it doesn't do it, you've got to increase the pressure up the ante a bit. But sure. And you come back to always asking nicely. Mm-hmm. I can't remember who it was that said the best form of punishment was to withhold reward. Mm-hmm. And I, I like that. Mm, you know, mm, don't, mm. don't reward it for being naughty. Reward it when it does it. Yes. It yep. Yep. If a horse starts playing up and getting fractious, ride it a bit better until you get the result you want. Then pat it. Don't start being too not giving it instruction. Don't. I guess I say that the horse's sympathy is clarity. Mm-hmm. So rather than do it a human thing, do a horse thing. Be clear with what you want, kind with what you want. When it does it, tell it it's okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, with the rider, we need sympathy sometimes. You'll be okay. Come on, you're okay. You're okay. You can do it. The horses need clarity and calmness and not 10 aids, but one aid until they do what you ask them and take the aid off, reward them. So I guess there's a lot of stuff in that question. I'm not even sure which question <laughs> I'm answering. <laughs> Tell us about, you know, because you're always looking yourself to support other people and encourage them and everything. Has there been someone along your journey that's supported you, encouraged you along, you know, horse-wise? If I said not really, then it wouldn't be fair because there have been. Mm -hmm. I think people think I'm pretty confident in getting on my way, but it's not true. It's a facade. Mm -hmm. When I was a kid, Elizabeth McMaster certainly did. When I was older, a friend of mine in Melbourne, we have set to so off sometimes, but Joe Brady would be saying to me, you know, you just get on these horses. When we go and see something, I get on it, and 10 minutes later it's going a lot better than it ever did, and I might have ridden for six months. Mm -hmm. There's another one called Ashley Jankowski. She's a show jumping lady, and her daughter's a, a show jumper, and she always thought that I had a lot of talent. Mm-hmm. And she's always been a supporter. Mm-hmm. And that's really nice. Mm-hmm. It was also, strangely enough, a guy called Eric Letter came. He was the oh, top of the FEI, whatever the president or whatever it was that they had at the time. He saw me ride a pupil's hack at a clinic that he came and did here. He actually told the organisers that I was the most talented rider he'd seen in the country. <laughs> but they didn't tell me. Didn't so I they? found that out. Wow. No. I thought they should have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I found that out three years later. (laughs) So I've just gone along. I now know that I know what I'm doing. Mm. Whereas before I just keep it quiet. Now, you know, I'm 60 years old. I don't know if you've got there yet, but once you get there, you just think, you know what, cop this. That's how it is. I know what I'm good at. I know what I'm not good at. I'm working on being better all the time at different things. I'm I'm trying to deliver the message a little bit more so that everybody can do it. It's mm-hmm. hard when I ask you to change something and you're struggling and you don't want to let go of the front end. It's hard. You mm-hmm. know? Mm-hmm. Some people think I want them on a loose rein, but I don't. But when I'm teaching someone who wants to hang on, I might make them put their hands up the neck and just let go for a bit and see mm-hmm. what happens mm-hmm. until they find a connection through their looser shoulder and softer elbow and through their closed hand and to their back and their seat and their leg, you know, just the, the correct way of riding all the time. Mm. So they go, so it's trained into them enough. So their go-to aid is a correct one, not grab them in the mouth. Mm-hmm. And I think if we train all our riders to do that, it doesn't matter what sport they'll do, their horses will go better. For eventing, if you train that, you train that the horse can open up the frame and stretch a bit. When you're in strife, you can let the front end out and push a bit and you get out of trouble. So, you know, I think there's there's a lot of importance in us supporting each other and finding a way of doing it. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of people under the surface who would be doing it. There's not a lot of higher level people who have done it. I mean, as a mm-hmm. judge, you don't get a lot anyway. 
these they you know we're the, the enemy in a sense because especially with um, social media and oh <laughs> this gave me higher marks therefore they're right yeah you know that, that flying change I was telling you about before where I was on the four and the others were on the sixes and sevens and the commentator was on the eight and the change was late mm. it's not always the high marks that's right I mean basically let your ego be the judge so um, you know it's it's all very interesting in how we deal with stuff and the way we get kids to deal with stuff these days too, I think yeah. we need to come back to a few of the old-fashioned values. And- yeah, what do you think? Because I'm thinking about, you know, you, you're doing quite a lot even as a judge. What do you think has been your proudest moment? I guess winning the Australian Championships at 16. Unfortunately, mm-hmm. Mum and Dad weren't there to see me. But that was a huge achievement on a very ordinary horse that I'd trained to do consistently well. Yep. And I guess another one, would, I've got a couple, which mm-hmm. then that wouldn't be proudest, would it? Oh, well, pr- proud moments. I can change that question around a bit. <laughs> I, um, I wrote FEI on a thoroughbred mare, chestnut thoroughbred mare that I had, and I went off and drove it up to Newcastle, back to the stomping ground, and my, my family came to, there was only one of them not there, but all my family came to watch me. I was 44, top hat and tails. Very was a nice horse. Only have nice horses, by the way. And you, <laughs> then you muscle them up so they're even nicer. And I went in the police and George and the into one. And I came out and my mum said to me, you're going to win that. And I said to her, apart from being my mum, because, you know, any good pony <laughs> club mum should think you're going to win. Yeah. Apart from being my mum, why do you say that? And she said, you were the only one not fighting with your horses, with your horse. And I went, uh-huh. oh, fair enough. That's, that's good that she noticed, yeah. you know, yeah. from a non-horsey person. A yeah. non-horsey person. It's all mm. about aesthetics, really. If someone has an eye for something that's beautiful, mm. when you're riding a horse well and it's going correctly, everything flows. The rider flows, the horse flows. It will look beautiful. So mm. I got to win a gold medal in FEI in front of my mum and dad. So I remember dad had, was on two walking sticks at the time because he wasn't young. <laughs> and dropped a walking stick on the way for me to go to the podium. So I picked it up and someone said, oh, that was nice of you to help that old man. And no one <laughs> knew my parents because, you know, mm. they hadn't seen him. And I was proudly saying, that's not an old man, that's my dad. <laughs> it was a nice moment. Mm. Mm. Another recent one, because I've just kept slogging it away, I became a Grand Prix judge when I was 32. I was the youngest Grand Prix judge in the world at the time. I've become an FEI eventing judge and I've got to three, four star and I've been asked to judge a few international classes, but I got invited by the FEI the other day to attend a seminar in Germany in January for judges that, that they're looking at for possible inclusion in you know pony championships, championships but like the Europeans, the WEGs and maybe even Olympics down the track. But there are only a couple of us in Australia asked to do that and I was one of them. Mm. I was secretly chuffed because I haven't sucked up to anybody. I haven't played their games. I've just kept going, doing what I think is right, being honest and being fair, and it's paid off finally. So I guess that from a writing point of view before and now from a judging point of view, I, I was pretty, I'm pretty proud of that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Good. We'll see what happens when I get there and it's freezing. <laughs> <laughs> Germany and winter. <laughs> Peter, you were talking earlier on about improving scores by 15%. Are there specific things, you know, that people can do or, or coaches can do or what sort of things would you recommend that people would do to improve scores? I'll be honest. Mm. <laughs> For a start, it's pretty simple. Horses are pretty simple. They only need start, stop, left and right. Mm-hmm. When you look at the training scales, rhythm, suppleness, contact, impulsion, straightness, collection. You start where you need to start. Most horses are obediently crooked. They're not properly forward. They're not carrying themselves. The way to make transitions where the horses can come forward and back correctly without cramping in the neck, I I often say the price you pay for doing something wrong in front is paid behind you, and you really need that to be coming through and the back to stay up. So just those simple, every single person that's wanted me to help them, I start where I see they need to start. Some of them like it, 
Some of them hate it because they think they're riding at Vance, Priest and George, whatever. Why do I have to do a straight line and a circle and a corner? Well, because it ties everything together, all the glue that ties those things together. Mm -hmm. Stretching the horse properly and not leaving it flop on the forehand without connection, you know. But the connection is a forward-feeling thing and the balance is on the seat and leg. Just getting the horse to swing through the back, improving the paces, the better the paces look, the better the balance, the better the softness, the better the harmony, the better the general picture, the marks are going to go up. And this was before we had half marks. You know, Now it's easier to, to not put them up so much because they'll sneak a half mark in rather than a full mark. Mm. Be mindful of the basics. Be mindful of the relaxation. Before I knew about the training scales, because I was a teacher, and I'm old, we talk <laughs> about the three R's, rhythm, reading, writing, and arithmetic. Mm. Well, I made up my own training scales before I knew it. I didn't even call them training scales. I just knew they were things that I needed to get when I was riding a horse. And first it was rhythm, then relaxation, then roundness, then revs. And this sort of... <laughs> That's a good one, yeah. So we forgot the rhythm where the horse was in a rhythm that was comfortable for it. It's like swimming. If you get into the right rhythm in the stroke, you end up with a second wind and you get strong, you come out of the water and you swim better and for longer. When a horse goes in the correct rhythm where it's not too fast, so it's not heading towards flight, and it's not sucking back and too slow and heading towards fight, they just start to relax. And then they breathe, and when they relax, they go to the reins, take the contact. Then you can start riding them a little bit more up, a little bit more stretch, a little bit more up, whatever, change the pace. But you can't hurry that. You've got to wait for that to happen. And when you wait for that to happen, it keeps happening sooner and sooner and sooner. So I think people need to be more aware of how their horse is feeling mentally, correspondingly, physically, and work on exactly what they've got, not work on what they want, but what they've got. And then maybe have to take one for the team. If you go in the test, you might have to just back off a little bit on certain things. But mostly if they're going forward and kindly, the marks stay up. If you're fighting them, the marks go down and the test starts to turn to dust as you go along and everyone comes out a little unhappy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think just adhere to the basics, make proper basics, sit properly and find a coach who really is telling you the right stuff, not just telling you what you want to hear. You might have to hear some things that are hard to hear, but you should never feel that you're stupid. You're not stupid. You're just learning and it's tricky and it means your body has to work and your core has to work and your legs have to be stretching down and under you, you know, and not using the knee pads to sit on a horse and the reins to sit on a horse with. Mm -hmm. All those basic things that just we used to do when I was a kid, now I do sound old. <laughs> There's no shortcuts. You need They need to sit better, to ride better. They need to understand what we require of a horse, how the movements all fit together, how a straight line, how a circle, how a curve goes into a shoulder in or a shoulder four or how you progress from shoulder four to travers or wrong there, how you progress to half pass, how you progress to lengthened strides, to more collected strides. What are we looking for when we pirouette? Pirouettes and shoulder ins are two of the worst written movements I see these days because people say, Oh, you do it in travers. I went, well, no, you don't. You know, what, what's the purpose of the exercise? What's this exercise trying to achieve? Mm -hmm. and how does it go about it? Is what you're doing going to achieve that? Or well, this is my favourite line. Are you just colouring in? Is this just pointless, busy work? Mm -hmm. Because so often it's pointless, busy work. It's just mm -hmm. doing an exercise for the sake of doing it so you can put on the double bridle and the top hat and tails or the tails and the helmet and go in a higher level test. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've all done something like that. But if you really want to be good, you really have to fix the floors down lower. Mm -hmm. If you take the lift to the top floor, you get out of the lift and you'll fall back to the step you should have been on eventually mm -hmm. around mm -hmm. that band. Yep. Peter, in this journey to be a judge, a rider, uh, and everything else in between, what's been your biggest challenge? Believe it or not, keeping my head on straight, believing that I can do this, not being beaten by the systems, earning enough money to do it since I've given up being a school principal. And I hear lots of instructors saying this, dealing with the people that come and go, 
that you put all the, the work into and they'll go off and go to someone else who you know isn't as good, but they, for whatever reason. You have to learn just to keep going. To, to, people are going to do that. They're going to go somewhere or not somewhere. It doesn't matter how well you make them go. Always there'll be someone that they think's better, and they'll often, often they think the overseas ones are better, but I think it's a bit funny after 44 years of my apprenticeship when they get someone who's been riding for five years coming from overseas to train them. Oh, they're from Germany or wherever. <laughs> I just shake my head. And, yeah, mm. It's called an apprentice. Mm. So I guess that's that's been... A hard thing, rationalising the fact that I can't afford to have a horse and keep riding and because I'm not out on a horse competing all the time, I'm not thought of so much as in the job of of a coach, I guess, Mm -hmm. which I find funny because I'm coaching winners. Mm -hmm. I think that that would be the judgement of that. But the the horse world's an interesting place. We do what we do. I do Mm. know that everybody does the best they can with what they've got. And I yes. need to realise that I'm doing okay and mm. just mm. keep going and keep believing that I'm okay instead of telling everybody else they are. I need to be telling myself, Gee, come on, buddy, you, you're doing okay. Just muscle it up. I was watching a guy online the other day. He's talking about all sorts of things. He talked about his father and how his father was the cleverest man on earth and he dropped out of school in third grade. Mm. And his wife, this guy's wife died of cancer and he was standing at the coffin his father came up beside him and said it was the last thing he taught him. And he said, just stand. Mm. Just keep on standing. Don't give up. Just stand. And I think it's a really good lesson for us all because we have ups and downs and you'll be popular one day and flavor of the month and then not flavor of the month, and, mm-hmm. you know, whatever. It's just how it is. It's no reflection on you often and whatever. And, you know, you win a test, you lose a test. Some judge will like you, some judge will hate you. Get off Facebook and get on your horse. Mm. But just keep standing. Just stand mm. up, turn up, dress up and shut up and get <laughs> on with it. <laughs> mm. Mm. I think that might be one of the That's things it. that I need yep. to be mindful of. You know, you spend a lot of your life by yourself in this world. In this mm-hmm. horse world, and, I, and I've I've done that. Okay. So you know, for me, it's keeping confident that I can do this, and mm-hmm. I'll be okay. Like I tell everybody else, they will be <laughs> taking my own advice. That might be the answer to that question. <laughs> okay. All right. The next one um, that I want to ask you about is just putting on your judge's cap. Just yeah. about trends in dressage. Oh, do you think trends are changing? Are they getting? Is dressage getting better, improving? What, what couldn't you say about that? I think we're getting better horses. Mm-hmm. And that's internationally? I mean, we are in this country, but yeah, yep, we've got yep. much we're better breeding horses. better. Yep. We used yep. to have, well, sometimes, we used to have horses off the track that we yeah. had to oh, try very and get much through so. the level. You know, yep. when they were hot thoroughbreds or cold thoroughbreds or broken down thoroughbreds or whatever mm. thoroughbreds we had or whatever, you know. We've got horses that are more athletically gifted. Temperamentally, we don't always have the better ones. There's more opportunity for people to buy schooled horses and compete on them. I don't know whether I'm jealous that that didn't happen to me or not, but I don't always think that that's the best way to go. I think at a certain stage, it's a good thing to buy a horse that's higher than the level of your own riding, Mm -hmm. as long as it's a good horse, as long as it's trained well. Getting the right feel, spending time to learn the basics, looking at the good internationals, the Ingrid Klimkers of this world, the Carl Hesters of this world. Go and sit and listen to the tapes and see what he's talking about, the straightness, the softness, the forward feel in the hand, the energy coming, originating from behind, you know, and how you fix this and that. I think they're going to give us better marks. I think we went astray for a while. I think people are starting to come back. We see a lot of, well, I see a lot of horses. You look at ads and see the development of the muscle. I think they need to stand back and check out what their horses look like and see how much muscle they've got coming out of the wither, seeing mm-hmm. where the bend in the neck is, if they have a bend in the neck. And if they do, should that be there? You know, they should flex at the pole, not behind the pole. How's their back looking? Are they getting more, not fatter, but are they getting more strength? And when we see that with true paces, because we see it, I remember judging a priest in George once. It had more lateral walks in it than I'd seen collectively in all my years of judging. 
that was a bit of a worry. We need to keep the paces true. We need to, to keep the system true. We need to be honest. We need to be fair. We don't need to kill them, but we need to set them on the right track. I guess mm-hmm. when I'm judging, I try and... Well, well, let's put it this way. I judged at Melbourne through our event last year, and the, pencil, the, the girl that was collecting the papers at the end of the day said to me, the second day said to me, are you a coach? I went, yeah, that's what I do for a living now. She said, ah, because if you read your sheets, you'll write a better test. (laughs) And I went, really? She said, yeah. I said, well, that's the aim. Mm. And I said, why? She said, well, you tell them what they need to fix, Mm. not it's on the forehand. You tell them how, in a sense, how to fix it, like impulsion, engagement, straightness, Mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. And I think if you if people are mindful of the training scales, I think that they'll improve. And I don't believe that the trends are right. I don't think there is there should be trends. I don't think one week we should be doing this and the next month we should be doing that. Good writing is good writing. Good training is good training. Good judging is good judging. And they all should be heading towards the same thing, which is happy horses going forward, you know, rhythm, suppleness, contact, impulsion, straightness, collection. But the horses should be happy. They should be willingly do it. It's supposed to be an art and they should do that. I look at Michael York jumping in that indoor cross country I put up on Facebook the other day. It's magic the mm. way his horses burn, the way they go to the fences, the planning that he has, the balance he's in. This is a happy horse doing really well. It's just a young one. When we see it, like my mum saw, why did I win? Why am I going to win, mum? Because you were the only one not fighting with your horse. I didn't just flop around not fighting with it. It was a pretty picture going well. But that communication that you have, why are we riding? Most people are riding because they love their horses. Well, consider what you're doing to it if you love it. Because the better you communicate with it, the more cooperative it is with you because of the way you train it and the way you reward it. The Mm -hmm. better your scores will be, the more chance you've got of getting somewhere, Mm -hmm. not just going somewhere because your ego got in the road. Mm -hmm. I don't know how how, what that sounds like, but I hope it doesn't sound mean. It's just trying to get people to think about what they're doing and improve it. Yep, yep. Correctly improve it, not just go higher and harder. If you're an equestrian coach or a horse riding instructor, or even if you aspire to be one, have a look at the free video series for horse riding instructors on the Horse Chats website. Go there now. Have a look. Horsechats.com. Have you got, and I know you will do because you you obviously read a lot, a book that you would recommend for our (laughs) listeners? Don't you remember I told you I'm not a good reader? You're not. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sure you'd have one at least. Um, I did read one called Moving the Cheese, which wasn't something like that. It was about change and managing change. Mm -hmm. But I think Reiner Klinker's book, I think it was Alaric, The Making of a Champion. Yes. Uh, Yep. I think that was a good read. I think Mm -hmm. it was interesting because of the way he talked about how he had to learn to deal with his horse, how he had to read his horse better going into the change of seasons. Mm -hmm. His horse wouldn't be as good changing its coat, so he had to back it off. He needed knew it had to be fit going into L.A., so he got a a venting fit going into L.A. and won a gold medal. He realised when he got tough on it, it didn't work. So I guess that was that was a good book. Mm-hmm. One that I remember from years and years ago, two that I remember from years and years ago, one was called Dressage for Beginners. I think it was written by Peter Churchill. I, I can't remember. But it explained how a horse carries itself. And one of the simple things was if you try and pick up a wheelbarrow by standing out the back of it, you can't do it. But if you bend your knees and squat underneath it, you can start lifting it up in front of you which talked about how you get engagement. So there are lots of imagery that you could go from there. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that I read, because I didn't have a horse of my own until I was 21, but I rode different things. I didn't go to Pony Club. And I read the Pony Club manual, and I learnt the Pony Club manual. So I learnt what a bone spavin was, what a bog spavin was, what thoroughpin was. I learnt how what a whisk was. I learnt what sort of feed you feed the horses. I learnt, learnt how to do a bandage and all these stuff that we assume people know, but they don't necessarily these days. We need to bring back the desire for riders to be horsemen and horsewomen 
mm-hmm. so that they can look after their horses better rather than just get someone else to groom it and throw them on to ride in their class. You know, they need to get a sense. I used to groom all my horses before I rode them. So I could mm-hmm. run my hands over them, spend a bit of time with them to get them. I know everyone can't do that because they're busier. But I think those sort of the Pony Club Manual was a great book. It was orange and sort of this funny yellow and reddy colour. <laughs> yes. And it was a great book. Mm, so uh, mm. that's one, and The Making of a Champion. And I don't know, though, I haven't seen Dressage for Beginners for so long. But um, okay. just simple good things. Something to think about. Nothing fancy. Oh, there's an account. Charles de Kunfi also has a good book called Advanced Dressage or something like that. Yep. So if you want to go a little bit higher up, there's some very good things in his book. He's a very clever trainer mm-hmm. and, a, and, you know, a correct trainer. Yep, yep. There. You ask me one thing, I give you four all the time. <laughs> told you a million yeah. times not to exaggerate. <laughs> <laughs> and remember, you can find all the books recommended by our guests at horsechats.com slash books. You can have a look at the guest page for the individual book they recommended or just look at the recommended books by order of popularity at horsechats.com slash books. Peter, tell me what your future holds. What, what are you looking forward to? God knows. That's, that's something I'm actually struggling with at the moment. I don't know that I should air this on this thing, but I'm actually struggling with what I should do. I've come close to giving up. I haven't yet. I don't know. I guess that I will keep going. I think I will be adding more photography to my work because I actually I love taking portraits, believe it or not. I brought a camera to take people and mm-hmm. I love taking uh, – to, to take horses, sorry. Yep. And I now take people and I okay. love it. I like showing – this This sounds so pathetic. People will vomit when they hear this possibly. But I like to show people they're beautiful mm-hmm. and they are. If it comes from their heart, it shows on their face. Mm-hmm. And it's easy to make people beautiful. It's easy to show them they're beautiful. Just talk to them while you're taking a photo. Get, catch them in a situation where something's tickling their heart and the face looks good. So I might head down there. Just a few different things. I've got a few ideas for my coaching, mm-hmm. and I've got a few ideas to improve the way coaches are coached and the way we do professional development for coaches. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Or don't do it, as the case yep. may be. Yep, yep. Anything you can talk about now? I'm, no, I'm yeah, pretty keen to listen. Away, yeah. I know, yeah, no, but I'll talk to you privately. Um, <laughs> there are a few people doing things like that now. Mm. But my idea: how, how are we going to improve our sport? Well, we can't put, as I like to say, lipstick on a pig. You can't just fancy up the way you talk about it. The product that you make has to be of absolute quality and it has to be of uniform quality. We should all be talking the same language, expecting the same things. If I say to you, I want to see that horse coming from behind or carrying itself or stretching or whatever, we should have the same picture in our minds of Mm -hmm. what that looks like. I don't think that's the case anymore Mm -hmm. or maybe never was. To tell you sort of where I'm headed or how I'm headed, I'll use an example of the the sailing people. After, I think it was Sydney Olympics, a sailing team, I can't remember if it's English, England or Australia. Anyway, whatever. A sailing team sacked all the people they had and hired a new coach because they won nothing. Mm -hmm. The new coach only hired people of excellence, even if it was the person answering the phone. They had to be absolutely the best people for what they did. So he surrounded himself with people of quality in the work they did, of the highest standard he could get, and that people who wanted to work with the highest standard, that near enough wasn't good enough. After a number of years, um, it was asked how the trainer was asked how he's going. He said, We need more funding and I need a little bit more time. And he explained where he was at and showed the people, and they gave him more time. At London, they won gold in every single category except one where they won silver. <laughs> I want to start doing something like that. There's mm-hmm. a reason, and this might, I might be attacked for this, but we're not winning the medals that we were in some of the sports and we're not winning them in dressage and we're, we're not even getting funding. When the world's going up in the marks, we've gone up in the marks, but we're not getting up high enough all the time. What's the reasons for that? 
Now, I'm not suggesting I know what the reasons for that are, although I have some ideas. We'd have to ask the stakeholders that. Mm -hmm. And then be honest and say, all right, well, how do we do that? And I think we need to have excellence in what we do. I think we need to get the best people we can possibly get. I was talking to some of the powers that be once, and they said they couldn't afford Carl Hester to come. He was too expensive for whatever amount of time. I said, I don't think you can afford not to have him come. Mm. Find a way, mm. you know, find a way of bringing the best to us. Mm. Go for second best. It's not good enough. And all sorts of level. I mean, it's not just that the trainers, it's everything we do about horses, the knowledge that we have about the way they work, the way their muscles work, the way their joints work, how we keep them sound, how we feed them, how we deal with stress, how we deal with travel, how we deal with the stomach sicknesses because so many horses are sick in the stomach. Barriers, competitions, you know, how we think about that. The modern thinking of competitions now for high performance isn't that it's a stress and you go and do it. It's there is no such thing. Every day is the same. You just go out and ride your train. Don't build it up in your head. So being able to provide opportunities for riders and coaches and you name it to get together in a venue and have international quality things presented to them, not just teaching them how to talk things up without the standard being good enough. Mm -hmm. And I'm not criticizing anyone for that, but we have to raise our standards. What we're teaching them has to be the same. Mm -hmm. It has to be on the same path or we're not going to, it doesn't have to be on the same sport. It could be raining, it could be camp drafting, could be jumping, could be eventing, whatever. Mm -hmm. But horses, they all go the same way. Yep, yep. I think um, you've certainly given a lot of people food for thought, uh, you know. I think hate, that's, and that's, that's what we've got to start with, is food for thought. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I, yep. I think I'm just trying yep. to, I'm a bit passionate about the sport still, so it probably will end up that I won't give up, although I, I'm coming close at the moment. I'm, I am struggling with it at the moment. Is that as a full-time coach, Peter? Uh, yeah, mm, I think mm. so. Money's mm. pretty tough at this time of year. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think it's it's just hard. I spent, look, says he, I'm about to do my fourth overseas trip in within 12 months, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, one, maybe, <laughs> maybe money isn't so tough. But, well, my family has helped me. My mum's helped me do that. Mm-hmm. And India, when I went to India to judge, they paid for that. Okay. But I've paid for the others. Mm-hmm. A little bit of help from EA. Yeah. But it's tough, you know. It's, sure. it's tough feeling like it's a struggle when I'm when you're 60 and think you should be retiring mm-hmm. rather mm-hmm. than just tired, retired <laughs> <laughs> again and again. So, you know, I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm passionate about learning. I'm passionate about the way we look, about, look after the horses. Mm-hmm. I think we need to do that better. I think we need to have them as our as our first entity of care mm-hmm. and not let our egos push us to where we want to go no matter what the horse thinks or feels about that. Okay. And, and I know you've been, you know, this reflected with what you've just said right through the whole interview today, but can you sum up your philosophy into a lesson? I think the standard you walk past is the standard you accept. So you should strive to be as good as you can be. You don't have to be perfect. The interesting thing about people is that with horses and with riding, there's a lot of perfectionists that don't succeed enough because of perfectionism. The only thing that you guarantee when you practice perfectionism is failure. Mm. So I guess we have to embrace the fact that we are, we're imperfect, but we, we're we entitled to be loved and we're entitled to belong in this sport. And the same with the horses. We need to get it right. We need to be cared for getting it right, but we don't need to be mollycoddled and there, there, isn't that fabulous, you know, like Facebook does. We need to be honest and say, yeah, that was great. What about this? Mm. And make realistic goals and set them. But we do have to make sure that we're looking after the welfare of the horse and then the welfare of the rider. But firstly, the horse comes first. You know, are we doing it right? Is what we're doing of benefit to the horse or are we just colouring in? What is the horse learning or unlearning something? Is it on the correct tracks, you know? And seek out someone that is going to be honest with you. Maybe they'll be tough, but seek out someone that's going to be honest with you that can help you, really help you, to give you an honest appraisal. Work from there. Mm -hmm. I just think that you can't do better than making the basics better. Every time I get even a Grand Prix horse to work with, I just make the basics better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you make the fancy better. 
Yep. How can people contact you, Peter? I've got a website. I did my own website a couple of years back, and I'm not even 17. I was. That's another proud moment. Let me tell you. <laughs> uh, what's, what's your website? PeterShawDressage.com. Okay. I have a Facebook page. If you type in my email address, which is oh, maybe I shouldn't give it. Maybe I'll get inundated with complaints. P- Peter.a.shaw <laughs> at Hotmail.com. If you type that into Facebook, I'll come up. But I'm on Facebook. Um, okay. And you could contact me that way or through an email. On, on my website, you can email me. And um, those those details will be available on your page, which will be horsechats.com slash Peter Shaw. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and through EA, I, I'm on the, as I'm a accredited coach. Mm-hmm. Um, on that list as well. Australia, yep. I can, yeah, I'll be on there. Okay. I'll be on their website when you go on a coach search. Okay. Peter, it's certainly been informative. You've exceeded expectations with the amount of information you've given us. I'm sure that people will enjoy listening to you. I Um, I hope so. I'm not sure I'm going to enjoy listening to us back. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, hope to hear from you again sometime soon. Thank you very much for the opportunity. It's been a really good thing for me to have to sit and reflect a little bit. I know I probably went on, but there's a lot of I've spent a lot of time lately thinking and reflecting about whether I'm going to keep going and where I've gone and whether I've been successful or not. So I think this was a for me personally, I'd like mm-hmm. to thank you for giving me that opportunity because I think it's helped to for me to realise that this is just what I do and you better just shut up and get on with it. Yep. Yeah, well, you certainly do it well and you've certainly um, made a positive impact, certainly on me, but, you know, other people that are going to be listening to this, it's it's extra information that they can take away and reflect yeah. on themselves, so it's been good. Okay, thank and you very much. And it's not sugar-coated. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Bye. Bye-bye. Now, if you're still there, you probably know that I'm absolutely passionate about education within the horse industry. That's why I host this podcast. My other venture is Online Horse College. Have a look now at onlinehorsecollege.com and I'll see you over there. Remember that our comments and instructions are general in nature and do not take into consideration your individual horses or your individual ability and circumstances. If you enjoyed this podcast, then please leave your comment below. 